We had 14 consecutive months where the month that just concluded was higher than the month before. That's never happened and it probably won't happen again in our lifetime. But along that way, volatility was forgotten. And volatility can be very painful to portfolios. And it makes things exciting. Between what Trump has said at 3 o'clock in the morning and what markets are doing in, in, in pre-market activity is always a real joy around 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, if, you, if you go back to November of 16, when Phil Orlando picked Trump to win, and he did, if you stayed out of the market because of political reasons or, or you were frightened, from November 4th of 2016 to December 10th of 2016, the market was up nearly 8%. The S&P, and we're talking about the S&P here, the S&P from December 30th of 16 to December 29th of 17 was up nearly 22%. And from December, on December 29th of 17 to the high water mark of the market on 2018, up another 5.7%. And during that period of time, the VIX, the volatility index, had fallen to nine on February the 22nd, it was at 39, excuse me, 29. So volatility re-entered the market. Why? Well, for a whole lot of reasons. We'll talk about some of those reasons today, why, what the markets are squeamish about, but. In 2017, corporate revenue earnings, the revenues were up on this year bottom line, up 10%. What a great year that was. Expecting roughly the same, if not more, for 2018. Profit margins were high, but guess what happens when interest rates go up? Profit margins get compressed. And so that's one and another one of the concerns that's, that has Wall Street a little bit on edge is if the Fed has to move too quickly, your profit margins will then be squeezed. And guess what happens when a profit margin gets squeezed? You have to raise prices. So you have to pass it on to the end user um, if you have that pricing power. Earnings per share for 2017, uh, year over year in the quarter four, up 15. We're expecting this quarter to be, the, which is the first quarter of 18, to be up close to 20%. And numbers are coming in to support that. So again, great numbers. And we haven't even run through a full year of having what corporate tax reform should do to bottom lines. Where are we going to finish this year? These are these are the these are the Phil Orlando projections. Uh, the one that we're, we're looking at is, is where is the S&P going to be? Uh, if you look at 2018, uh, 3,100 is his projection. I think he's brought that, I think he dialed that back to 3,000 if I remember, John. Uh, so that, that's another 10 plus percent from where we are right now, if you believe that he is correct. And then in 2019, we have another, another 8, 9% on, on top of that. So again, 2018 and 2019, look pretty solid, but we're going to have a rough road to get there. As Gib has described, uh, really points it out. These are the issues that are out there at this moment's time that could turn a market. But I wanted to walk through this and just Take a moment and look at it. Okay, the Fed's policy and leadership transition uncertain. Well, we worked through it. We got a new Fed chair. Market seems to be okay with that. They're comfortable with it. It was a January concern, a January worry. We're now got a new chairman and we're working through it. Trade war possibilities. Now that's a big one. Folks, if we get into a trade war, that's one, that's one of the ones given I gotta make some changes on, we gotta move in a hurry. But let's talk about what's going on today. The Secretary of the Treasury, Larry Kudlow, a bunch are heading to China. They want to sit down, they want to have open discussion, and they're gonna have conversations going on. Next week is NAFTA, it has to get decided. 
There's discussion being going on right now of the things that have to be done with the deadline understood needs to be done. The, the president negotiates, for, I, I don't know if we all agree, but the president negotiates from a different way of doing business. He takes out the big hammer and the big swing, and he swings hard and goes to the death con five and tries to bring it and he wants to step it back. That's his style. That's what people are beginning to understand how he does. And those discussions to solve those trade issues and not get us into a trade war is underway at this point in time. So there is some sense from our perspective that solutions that we aren't going to get into a trade war. But that's a reality that we've got to be faced with. The inverted yield curve. Now, if you've been with us for any period of time, we, you've heard us say if there's an inverted yield curve, we believe there's going to be a recession. We'll say it to you right now again. We believe that's a true sign. But I'll show you something and give, and if you take our weekly market commentary on the second page of the weekly market commentary, we gave you some facts. Think of a runway. If the yield curve goes flat, again, what is that? We've got a short-term rate equal to the long-term rate. Inverted means that short-term, you can get a higher rate of return than a longer term. And so there's no sense in going out there locking money up for a long period of time because I can be short and I can get a better rate of return. So a neutral yield curve or flat yield curve, there's no difference. And we are within 50 basis points of that this week. All right? So you've got to get a little concerned that we have a yield curve issue. The runway on a yield curve historically, going back all the way to 1980, to become a recession is anywhere from 15 to 24 months. And in that 15 to 24 months, the stock market is up 21 percent. So the worst thing that we could do right now, we believe, is just because the numbers might have been going flat, is to yank y'all out of the stock market. We got to watch it. We got to give you enough data to think through it. We got to explain what we're thinking about. But we got to go back, like filled in with us, and say you got to understand where the market is and what it's based on. Um, the Mueller investigation. I got a big question mark. Who knows where that's going to go? That's something we got to watch. I don't know how we even plan for that at this point in time. But that's an issue. It's out there. Um, Midterm elections. Same thing. I do agree with Gibb, and you can go back and see if we have a divided Congress and a divided Senate. It really doesn't matter if the president is Republican or Democrat. The market seems to be doing well under any, any of those scenarios. So we aren't really worried about it. Geopolitical risks. In June, we're supposed to have another conference, or the first conference. That's good if it can come about. Who knows what's going to come about? But there's dialogue going on. We aren't talking about anymore have, who has the biggest button that they can press on the desk. Okay, so that's something good. Uh, from the standpoint of Congress, Washington, I agree with Gibb, it's a mess. It's a mess, and I don't think we do anything that. And evaluations, we've got to watch. Now, my only point in this is, these are concerning issues, but the issues are working themselves through. And as we think about how to invest, we're looking for information daily on that because on the other side of this, on the other side of this, you have to take this information that we study. Economic data points. I'm going to throw them out. Housing, employment, interest rates, manufacturing, consumer confidence, earnings. And if you did those five or six things and looked at where they are right now year over year, you know what? They're all up. They're all up. So we've got all these issues, but we're on top of a strong, strong basis. So what, as I was thinking about this, what we're trying to do in this setting, and what we try to do all the time, is to give you a perspective. A perspective of where we are. A perspective that you can get comfortable with or a perspective of understanding how we're thinking and why we're making decisions so you can get a sense of where we think the market is and how we should invest all the money. If you take the next chart, 
following that uh, uh, chart there of the ups and downs. And then you just ask yourself and look at it. The average bull market lasts nine years with a total upside opportunity of 480%. The average bear market lasts 1.4 years with an average cumulative loss of 41%. Now, we're in the mature end of this bull market. And we're going to have volatility. We don't guarantee anything, except I'll guarantee you that. We're in the mature end of a bull market, and we're going to have volatility. But we believe there's still opportunities out there, and we got to find the we got to give you the perspective to understand why we're doing what we're doing, and we got to find your comfort level of your willingness to be where you want to be, because in doing this, we think there's still upside opportunities. And we go through this, we are all the time looking at that inverted yield curve. And we're talking about it. We're talking about what's the runway. We're talking about what's the signs telling us. We're talking about the economic data. If I have an inverted yield curve and then that five lists that I've been touting all night wasn't there, and we began to see erosion in those, you better believe we're going to make changes. We're going to make changes. But we're going to watch it and see what the economic data is. Gibbs talked about the high stock evaluation. It's something we've got to keep our eye on. Trade wars, we've said from a trade war standpoint that that is a critical piece, but we think discussions are going on. And then who knows about the uh, Mueller Trump and where that is. We'll have to just react to it. So, with all that being said, the summary from us is, at this point in time, we still believe the market has an upside opportunity. Low single digit, high double digit, high double, single digit, low double digit for the year. Carries into 2019, we'll have to see where that is come after the first quarter of next year. We're moving more and more to sectors. We're look, we've already done and positioned our portfolio in the bonds to these floating rates, and we're studying the data on a daily basis with these key people, these key pieces, and we're getting outside help. This is just not us. We're getting three and four and five sources giving us outside help to help us understand that. One of the